Great. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about scaling teams with event-driven architecture. And um, we've had some good talks the past few days, and I, and I actually realized that I can probably splice together this whole talk from you know, what Aslam and Juan and Raina said yesterday. And this is actually a good thing to me. I think it, it means that we're all facing similar problems and that we're solving them in similar ways. Uh, and I find that reassuring. Cool. So who am I? Uh, my name is Corver. I work at Luno. For those of you that don't know, we are a Bitcoin uh, wallet. So if you want to huddle some Bitcoin, you can sign up uh, and buy. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see I've got a Twitter handle. I actually signed up to Twitter only two days ago in preparation for this talk. So I'm in desperate need for some followers. Please. <laughs> this is my shameless plug. Not for Luna, but for myself. <laughs> um, all right. Quick overview. We are gonna, I'm going to start off with just a quick overview of what Luna, what our systems kind of looked like before events in the old days. Um, and then dive a little bit into what do you mean by event-driven? So the different types of architectures, the different styles of events that, um, that's out there. And then I'm going to dive specifically into two types, streams and queues. Um, and then finally, just cover our, our solution that we went for in the end, which is SQL-based Event, event, event streams. So, when I started working at Luna, which was 2017, pre, -work, uh, pre the Bitcoin bull run, we were a small team. I think we were about 10 backend devs, and we were quite relaxed. So, um, yeah, so as, as the dude said, why add, what, adding more logic to an already massive handler function? Sure, why not? Um, and that worked. So, we didn't preemptively scale, we, we just did what worked. But then 2017 happened, as you all know, and yeah, where we are now, two and a half years later, sitting around with a build team of 100 people, so almost 10x scale in two and a half years, and we had to solve a lot of problems along the way. So taking a step back, this was our, so, looking here at the kind of the evolution of our sign-up handler as an example. So we have an API, a user wants to sign up, they want to become part of Luna, they want a wallet, uh, and so you know, the front end would send a push request, with, uh, a post request to the sign-up endpoint. So now we have this handler, and in the beginning it's quite simple. It just creates a user and adds it to the database. But we probably want to do more things at the same time. We want to prep some more stuff. So we'll add some wallets, maybe a Czar wallet, maybe a, a, a Bitcoin wallet. We might want to generate uh, a BX reference. So that's if, if you want to do an EFT into, uh, if you want to send uh, RANDs into Luna's bank account, you should use this reference because then we can allocate the money to you. That's a random number that's generated. Sometimes there's like clashes when we insert it into the database. So, so that can fail. Um, and then there's generating addresses. So this is Bitcoin addresses. We want to give you a receive address. Um, so maybe we either go to the Bitcoin node, generate some addresses, or like we later did, we have a table prepped with some addresses. So we want to assign it to you. But that table might not have any available addresses at that time. So, so this can fail as well. And then finally, you want to send a verify um, e email, right? So Welcome to Luno, please verify your email address and then it will go on to the subsequent steps. So this isn't too bad, right, for a sign-up handler. You're doing four database stuff and you're, do, you're um, doing one call to the email server, um, so it's still manageable. But now we're starting to grow. We're adding more teams, we're adding more functionality. Okay, that should just be one of them. <laughs> um, okay, any case. So, then we said, okay, cool, now we're having this problem of people signing up with these 10-minute spoof emails, right? So we, we don't want that, so we sign up to a third party and we use them to validate these email addresses. And that goes out over, over, the, um, over the internet, the blue blocks. The gray blocks, for example, sign up attack, we have a microservice that checks, you know, m maybe we're under some kind of a sign up attack, in which case we want to display more captures. Um, 
we integrated a, a third party KYC service. So this is a third party that kind of checks your identity, who you are, and we want to register this new sign up with this third party system. And then at some point we add a fraud team uh, and they, they want to do fraud checks and they maybe want to screen for politically exposed people. So we need to call out to this uh, fraud um, microservice or this other fraud service. And once again, you're doing network calls and all of these things can fail. M maybe the fraud service is being deployed at that time. And then finally, marketing gets involved. We have a promo team. Uh, we, we, we have marketing campaigns and allow people to register promos and get some uh, specials and discounts. And we also want to push that new user to our CRM system, which might also be a third party system. So yeah, you can obviously think this is, be is becoming quite heavy, complex. You're doing a lot as part of one handler. You're doing network calls, 12 or more of them during, the, during this one synchronous flow. And all of these things can fail independently. And sign up is quite important, right? If you, if you error out when a user is signing up, you might lose them. And that's a, that's a revenue stream for his lifetime that, that we lose out on. And so you might say, OK, cool, some of these things, let's add retries around them. Uh, let's try at least five times if the service is up or down. And then we say, OK, cool, we, we do like best effort, right? So we try three times. It doesn't work. Um, we'll, we'll fix it later. Let, you know, just continue. Um, OK, cool. So that doesn't work, right? So that doesn't scale. More is not more. You can't just keep on adding, adding more stuff. And reasons are testing becomes difficult. So how do you unit test that handler? You're doing 12 different uh, backends or services that you're calling. Uh, it really becomes complex. Failures are compounded. So if, I'm, if, I, if I can't connect to the one service, I might error out, what do I do? Um, it really becomes difficult to manage all your different failure, failure scenarios. Local dev is hard. I want to spin up a local server, and I want to test it. I want to test my dev flow. Now I need to mock out a bunch of different third parties just to do sign up that I don't really care about. I mean, this is just local dev. I just want to see whether the UI is working. And, um, and then the biggest thing is ownership. So ownership is, is unclear. If, if our sign up endpoint is erroring, a bunch of 500 errors happening, who can I go to and say, hey, guys, you know, this thing is broken. So I might go to the user's team, but they're saying, no, it's the promo team. Their thing is erring. Go to the promo team, and they're saying, no, but something else is wrong. It seems like it's the fraud guys. So you're hopping around different teams, um, and, and yeah, ownership is unclear. So this kind of touches upon what Aslam said, which is once teams start stepping on each other's toes, you need to, you need to start decoupling. You need to start thinking of, of something else. Um, so the next thing we did, we said, cool, what can we do as a next step? And um, what we did was just very basic async. So we have the synchronous handler doing all this stuff. And we said, OK, but can't we move some of these things just asynchronously? So this is before events. This is just like we have very simple uh, loops. It's a thread, sits in a forever loop, um, and it sleeps. Well, it lists stuff from the database. It iterates over those things, and then it processes them, and, and then it sleeps for 10, for 10 minutes. So for example, um, let's take our Bitcoin addresses, right? So during that handler, we were trying to generate Bitcoin addresses. But let's say the table was, there wasn't any available addresses or something like that. So we can now query, list users where uh, you know, number of addresses is zero. Cool. So we get all those users, and now we generate a bunch of addresses for them, um, and then we just wait 10 minutes and we try again. So that's nice. So you have best effort in the synchronous case, and then async house, housekeeping loops that make sure stuff is still happening. You might even move things out completely to async. So let's say uh, promo codes, right? I don't want to, we don't have to redeem those promo codes synchronously in the handler. We can. We add a column to the user's table saying promo code redeemed at. And um, so I just list users where promo, code, where promo code redeemed at is null, get all those users, and see if I can 
redeem their promo codes, updating their state, and then sleeping again. So these async loops are actually very powerful. We still use them in certain cases, and yeah, and they're great because everything is stored in the database. You can just start up this service, and it'll make sure it kind of pushes the state uh, the way it should be. But this is not enough. So I think async loops are cool, but you need to do better. And I think one of the main reasons are specifically for the best effort synchronous and then a housekeeping async loop is you have two flows. Um, that means that you have duplicate logic to a certain extent, and you probably have duplicate tests. Second of all, that's sleep, right? So now th think about promos. So every 10 minutes, you're scanning your whole DB table. Okay, you might have an index, but still, it is getting quite expensive. So we've limited to every 10 minutes redeeming promos, and the marketing team comes and they says, we can't wait 10 minutes, users sign up, and, and they want their promos redeemed immediately. So then, where do you go? Do you go one minute, do you go one second, you go one millisecond, and you know, those are difficult trade-offs, and it's, it, it's hard to make those, um, those decisions. I think the, an, the important one maybe is the fact that all these all this logic needs state in the, in the database. So I need to add a column to, to my user's table saying promo code redeem that. And that means that I'm linking two things. I'm linking the marketing team's logic to my user's table. And so once again, you're back to kind of tight coupling with ownership still a problem. If my promo code redeem app query is like overloading my database, whose fault is that? It's the user's DB but it's the promo team doing the query. So at this point, we said, okay, we need to do more. And, um, and this is a talk about events. So obviously, the next step was, cool, let's, let's do events, let's look, let's look into it. And then, yeah, so events is quite complex. If you, think, if, if you enter it from the start and you look out there what, what's available, um, and luckily we found this great talk by M Martin Fowler, um, and it's called, what do you mean by event-driven? And he covers three, three basic patterns. Uh, event notification, event state, um, event carried state transfer, and event sourcing. So looking into those a little bit more, we've got event notification. So this is quite intuitive, I think, if you're coming from a crowd world. Um, so let's say that same endpoint, sign up. Post comes into the user service. The user service now creates the user in, in the user's DB. Now, instead of doing all those other things, it just takes, um, well, it stores a notification event in your event store. And a notification event is super simple. It's basically just a pointer. It says user X has signed up and maybe a timestamp. It's important to note that there's no other information. There's not much other, I don't know what is his email, I don't know all these things. It's just a notification event that something happened. So our fraud service, it now has to, well, it then subscribes to events. Okay, cool, sign up event comes in. Um, I wanna do some fraud checks. So, but I don't have any information. I just know user X signed up. So I now need to go to the user service, query the user service, give me the user X um, object, and now I can run my checks and uh, perform whatever logic is required. So that's notification events. Next up, event carried state transfer. This is a quite a strange name. I think it's kind of a play on REST, you know, uh, is it a resource state transfer? <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so what you do here is it's very similar to event notification, except that there's more decoupling. The fraud service shouldn't or is, is not allowed to query the user service for more data. And that means that what you do is you communicate all data via the events. So instead of just doing a notification event where you have user and type sign up, you're adding all the information that's available. What is the IP that he signed up with? What's his language, country? Uh, email, maybe the app version that he signed up with, and then other services can subscribe to these events uh, and then react to them. But since the fraud service can't query the user service, 
it probably needs to keep state in its local DB of, the, of previous users that signed up. If I need to know if subsequent events for the same user comes through, and I want to know what was the email that he signed up with, I need to now look in my own DB. So in this case, uh, other services are basically copying the state or storing a part of the state of the, of the other service locally and querying that because they can't query the, 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 the original source. What's good about this is obviously the decoupling, right? The user service can go down completely. It can disappear. The fraud service is not, is, won't be affected by that. It just keeps on processing. So this is quite powerful, but um, as Martin Fowler states, this is not used that often. Um, and then finally, event sourcing. So this kind of turns the whole thing on its head, where um, instead of first going into a service and then into your event store, your event store becomes your primary source of truth. User signs up, and then there might be obviously some logic, but you want to do as little as, little as possible and take that event and just store it into your event store. And that event store is an append-only log of data that comes in, and all services subscribe to events from this. They will then obviously maintain some local state, um, and they would have to because you can't query that e event store for what is the user's current email. The event store just has this user signed up or this user changed his email address, or, but what is the state now? You can't query that from the event store, so the, you probably have to do some kind of materialized view uh, in each service um, to make the current state available. But, and then, how do you then produce events? They all throw events back into that central event store and other, um, and other services then subscribe to that. So this is obviously quite a new paradigm. Uh, I think Kafka is one of the big uh, drivers or enablers of this. Um, okay, cool. So we have those three things, and we looked at them, and we said, okay, which one, which one should we pick? And um, we actually just went for event notification. And the reason is it's, it's, um, it's a natural extension of CRUD, right? You're doing your CRUD. You're doing your updates in your DB, and I can then just, in addition to doing the CRUD, I can also send my notification event. I don't need to re-architect my system. And that means it's an incremental migration. Which is, always, which is always simpler and easier to do. And I don't need to do all, all my services at once, right? I can just start with the user service, start emitting user events, um, and my other services don't even need to have events. So um, I think it's, it's quite a nice incremental way of doing things. So cool, we said event notification, and now we start Googling um, which event store can I use? And obviously, there's a ton out there, and how do you make these decisions? Um, we've we looked at them, did some research, and basically classified them into three different uh, main, main areas. Message queues, event streams, and then compute engines. I know compute engines, it's, got, it's kind of a word I made up, but it's basically, so, so, so Apache Storm and Spark, even though they also, they talk about events, they talk about streams, I think of them more as, a, a, as like a streaming map, map, map reduce type solution. They're more aimed at processing the data, at changing the data, at aggregating it, um, while uh, message queues and event streams are just stores of events, pub sub. You publish events to them and you subscribe to events from them. So in our use case, we quickly eliminated the uh, Spark and storm in these kind of solutions because that's not where we are. We want to solve just event communication between services. And what remains, message queues and event streams. So diving into those a little bit more, queues. So queues are quite simple, right? They are linked lists at the heart. Uh, they might be quite big uh, linked lists, so you can actually store a lot of data in them. But kind of the base remains the fact that you, when you write into them or when you push something into the queue, it goes at the, at the tail. And when you read something from it, you read from the head. And by reading, you pop it off the queue. So it's not there anymore. 
So pushing on the one side, popping out the other. Streams, on the other hand, are a bit different. They are, at the base, kind of implemented as append-only logs. So you can see, if I go back, you know, the, the events are the same. They're all there. But the way that you read and write um, is kind of the, the difference, right? So when you write in an append-only log, you just add to it. You just add more at the end. Uh, and what's important is that each event has a, has a, has a number or an ID or a sequence. And that's usually incremental, like monotonically incremental or, or sequential. And then when you read from it, instead of you know, removing something from the stream, you just copy it and you increment your cursor. So I think the important thing here is to know that as a reader, you keep a cursor of where you are in the stream and I can just read, read, read um, you know, sequential events. So if we put all of that into a table, uh, queues versus streams, you basically, so I think the main difference is the fact that the one is mutable and the other one is immutable. In queues, the data changes. When I pop something off, it's gone. It's not there anymore. Versus streams, it stays there. The, the data is immutable. It just keeps on growing. And that means, in, in terms of consumers, is a queue only has you can only consume one event once. If you've consumed it, it's gone. While streams, you can add as many consumers as you want. They all just need to keep an independent cursor. You know, wh where are they in the stream? And you can just add, add, add as many, as many consumers as you want. And so how do you make progress? Well, for queues, you act. So you just say, thanks, I got it, I've processed it, and that basically pops it off the queue while with streams, you would just increment your cursor. And what do you do if there's errors? With, with, with queues, you can knack, which puts it back onto the queue, making it available for somebody else to, to use. And then as I think Juan said, uh, there's this concept of a dead letter queue. So after you've, re after you've knacked a few times, uh, the system will take that event and add it to a dead letter queue. While with streams, it's immutable, right? You can't act or knack anything. You can just, it's just you and the, and the stream is, really doesn't care about you. So you can just retry processing the same event. Maybe it's a logic or a temporary network issue that's causing the error. Then you can just retry or you can fix the bug. But if it's a data issue, then you're gonna just have to skip that event. Um, so, Queues versus streams, and we decided, uh, well, we, we went for streams. And I think the main reason is the fact that you have these multiple consumers uh, per queue. I don't need to have a lot of like automated infrastructure that builds new queues as I add new providers. I just have my stream and I can just add consumers to it. Right, so now we are set. We've done the research and we are gonna build stream-based event notification. So getting back to the user service, you know, the event comes in, we're gonna create our user and then we're gonna send this event, uh, this sign-up event to our event store. So that, those of you that's worked with this before can probably spot the problem um, and it's there. You are doing two different things, right? Two network calls, and you, and now, yeah, you, well, what's the problem? The problem is the cloud and network. So we, we as developers, we tend to think the cloud is quite reliable, like the picture on the left. Um, it's gonna work, right? I'm, I can insert something into the DB, and I can insert something into the event store, and it'll work. Yes, it will work 99.9% .9 of the time, but there's that 1% where it's not gonna work where the network becomes unreliable. Uh, and the three types of failures, well, the three outcomes from any network call is a success. So I've stored my, I've created the user in, the, uh, in my database, or a failure comes back, the database says, you know, uh, this duplicate unique key, or uh, maybe the database is unavailable, it responds with an, with an internal server error or whatever, um, you get a failure. So those two cases are quite easy to handle normally. I think the insidious one is the unknown case. And that's where you send an event, 
it maybe stores it in the database, and then on the way back, the, your network call gets lost. Network drops the packets, and what happens is your connection times out, and you don't know. You don't know if you stored the event in the database or not. So you have this unknown state. Um, and that really gets tricky. So how does that affect, what kind of outcomes can we get with this problem? So if we say, I'm gonna first store my, I'm gonna create my user in the DB, and then I'm gonna store my event in the event store, and the event store call fails, then you end up with a sign up and no event. If you say, okay, I'm, I'm actually gonna swap it around. I'm gonna first insert the event into the event store, and then I'm gonna create the user, then you might end up with an event, and let's say the DB is not available. Then you end up with an event, but actually no sign up. And then you can do all kinds of more interesting things. You can start a tr uh, database transaction, insert the user before you commit, uh, you, cr you create the event, and then if that succeeds, you commit the transaction, but that commit can still fail. Um, and so you add some retries maybe, uh, but you can then, due to that unknown state, you can end up with a sign up and, and duplicate events. So depending on your use case, you can pick one of these. Probably the best one is a sign up with duplicate events, um, but, but yeah, it gets tricky. And if, and we were looking at this problem and we said, okay, but what can we do? How, how do other people solve this? And what we actually decided is SQL solved this a long time ago, right? We have SQL transactions. And what if we take our event store and we just add it into the database? So a table in the DB. So you have your users table in which we do our CRUD. And then we have a user events table, which is this append only log of mutations of events of changes to our users table. So when that, si when that sign up comes in, we do one SQL transaction, we create the user and we insert an event. So on the left you see the user, and on the right you see the event, it's of type sign up, and it's a notification event, so it just points back to, to the user ID. The event itself has an, has an ID as well, if you, if, if you guys think back about that stream, uh, the stream implementation, each event has, has a sequence. Now a new user signs up. Um, that user will be 1004, we, we create also a, a sign up event for, for that user, and for example, let's say our, you know, uh, 1003, that user changes his email address. He goes from A at B.com to Z at B.com. So he calls the update email address. We mutate that user's table, like you normally do, CRUD, it's an update, um, but we insert a new event into the user events table, pointing back to that user, and it's of type email, email changed. So cool, so you're doing your CRUD and you're inserting all these events and it's in SQL transactions, which means that you have um, exactly once event persistence guarantees. And that's a great place to be. So if you know, you know, I have for all my events, uh, for, for all my updates to my system, I have one event, that's a great place to start building your events um, architecture on top of. And then if we kind of zoom in on that user events table, and it looks like that stream, uh, that abstract append only stream that we saw with the IDs incrementing. So if you squint hard enough, a lot of things become append only logs. And in this case, uh, we have SQL tables that have auto increment IDs and, um, and immutable rows. So it's a stream. And so instead of taking that stream and now synchronizing it with Kafka or some event store, what we said, well, what if, what if our services can just provide a streaming API? So along with CRUD, you know, I can look up a user, I can create a user. What if I add like a stream user events endpoint to that service, and it's like a WebSocket HTTP2, while well, we use gRPC streams, but it's a, you can think of like a WebSocket connection, you open it, and it just all new events get streamed to you. Then, actually, we can skip the central event store. We don't need to add it. Uh, so, 
You can then do peer-to-peer -peer streaming between your services uh, directly. Uh, and that's what we did. You can check on GitHub. Uh, there's a link at the end. We wrote a library called Reflex, and it does event streaming um, from SQL uh, and also via an API over gRPC streams. And we've recently added streaming from S3, so you can also stream from an S3 bucket like a Firehose output. Um, so that brings that streaming very nice into our code uh, without any centralized um, event stores. So how does this look like? Uh, we've got the user service, sign up comes in, it creates users, updates users, and it inserts user events. The fraud service has this long-lived streaming connection, streaming events as, as the events happen, the fraud service is um, basically subscribes to these events and they're notified of the events. Fraud service can then decide, uh, do I care about sign up? Do I care about uh, email changed? It can then query the, the latest user data, perform whatever fraud uh, logic it needs to do, uh, and then update its, its fraud data in, it, in its database. And then it might also create events, so it might have a fraud events table, and other services can then uh, stream fraud events and react to that. The user service can actually react to fraud events and say, okay, if the fraud service uh, flags a user, I can update the user's state to be uh, flagged or, or something like that. So, yeah, you have this bi-directional, well, you have this peer-to-peer -peer streaming, and each service can, can, can stream directly from, from another, another service. And the cool thing is that you just have one technology, it's SQL. Um, and we're very comfortable with SQL, you know, we do it every day. So, as all technologies, right, you have to become an expert in it. Um, we feel that SQL is something that we're comfortable with and um, any problems that we come up with, we can probably solve. Cool, so taking a step back. Um, this was our sign-up handler at the beginning. We had 12, we had all these synchronous steps very brittle, lots of failures, lots of retries, um, multiple teams all stepping on each other's toes, and, um, and now with this events architecture, we, we can basically, sorry, there we go. We can simplify that handler to just do the bare minimum. So we still need to create a user, right? That's, um, and we're now gonna insert an event, and those two are two DB calls. But we might still wanna do some really important third-party stuff like validating email, because maybe we don't even wanna create that user and, and sign up attack. So now it's fine to do that, because it's less. There's less things. We, don't, we can still do that synchronously, so you don't need to farm everything off asynchronously. Um, but it's much easier. Um, yeah, so less, less is definitely more in this case. Um, testing is simpler. There's not nearly as many third-party things that you need to mock uh, and test. Failures are decoupled. If my promo service is having problems, I can still do signups. Even if my email server is overloaded and emails are bouncing, I can still sign up users and they'll get their email hopefully soon, uh, but I can still sign up users. Local dev is also easier, right? Just there's less to mock, there's less complexity. I can spin up a server and I can actually sign up locally um, by just mocking those two endpoints. And ownership is clear. So the sign up service is owned by the users team and uh, they own that whole handler. If there's any problems with it, uh, I can go back to the users team. I can say, hey guys, you need to fix this. They can track the latency of that endpoint over time, and they can fully own it, making sure that the response rates is up to scratch, implementing their workarounds without other, other teams stepping on their toes. Yeah, and that's kind of reaching the end. Um, how much time do we have left? 10 minutes, okay, cool. So we have a little bit of time. Um, so there's always more to it, right? So this seems quite easy. So the, there's a lot to the following three points. Um, this is just form information, but 
So how would you do distributed transactions in this system? Um, and we, instead of doing distributed transactions, we do state machines. So the user service might have a sign up state machine that clicks through different states. Uh, it might subscribe to fraud events and once it gets a fraud OK check, it'll actually sign the user up clicking through the next state. So yeah, we, we try to avoid distributed transactions uh, quite judiciously uh, and, uh, and make heavy use of state machines. They're quite powerful. You can do sub-state machines. So if the user is in processing state, um, that can actually farm out to a different service that does a bunch of sub-state machines and then sends an event back to the user service that finishes it. Um, another important thing is streams deliver duplicate events. Uh, so this kind of touches upon that initial thing of uh, you know, exactly once event persistence. On the delivery side, you will, you, I think it's pretty much impossible, and it's just very hard to get exactly once um, event delivery semantics. So what we do is we just say, okay, all events, you, will, you, you, you might get them twice. Uh, and we solve that by saying all consumers of events must be item potent. So item potent it just means that if you get the same event twice, the second time it doesn't error. Like create user and then create user the second time, it just says, okay, cool, user already created. Um, so item potent consumers, super important. Uh, and then finally, so we, have, we still have mutable state in the DB, right? We're still mutating state, we're updating the user. And then usually the next question is, okay, but what about audit? Uh, what happened to those, all those intermediate states? What happened to the intermediate email address? What if I want to look that up? And we don't solve that exactly. We do a best effort, which is uh, there's a consumer that consumes these user events, and every time it gets a new event, it just queries the user uh, and stores the current state of the user in S3 or in our data lake. So you basically have all the, all the different states of all the user objects over time stored um, in a data lake for audit and analytics purposes. But obviously, um, if the user states, if the user changes quite quickly, like two emails ex uh, changes right after each other, you might miss that intermediate state, but it's okay in most, uh, if that's a problem, then you need to solve that specific problem explicitly. Um, cool, I think that's, that's me. Okay. Hi, so using um, the SQL event mechanism, how do you deal with things like event expiry? Event expiry? Um, well, so since it's an append-only log, the event will always remain in the database. Um, so, I mean, it, Probably at some point that table will become too big and then you need to maybe compact it or something like that. But SQL can do quite big tables and uh, so we're lucky at our scale, we don't have that problem. And, so, and then it's up to the consuming service to decide, okay, I'm consuming these events, maybe I was down for um, you know, an hour or so, I come back up, then it just needs to have logic built in. I don't actually care about old events as, as a consumer, I, uh, I only care about new events, so I can just skip old ones. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, so with something like Nats or Kafka or Rabbit, like you'll often have high availability, and then you'll either connect to one of those RPs, or you can have a whole series of RPs, and then as um, that scales, um, you'll get connected to one, and if it falls over, yeah. you'll get bounced around. Have you redeveloped that so that as you scale your customer service, you'll connect to one, or do you have a single customer service, or how does that work? And then I guess with that is that dynamic of, um, if you've got multiple, how does it know that it's shared the one job through the one service, but not through the other? Or do you just say it's okay that those events are just gonna be duplicated over the wire? Yeah, so, so we, we do event notification, right? And event notification is always a pointer back to something that happened in the database. 
So the database is, the, is, is your source of truth. So we do have multiple user services. Uh, we use Kubernetes, so we have five replicas of the user service. So when you do CRUD, you don't know to which instance you're talking. But they all just go back to the database. So, and they all would be inserting events into the same events table. So if I'm creating a user, it goes into the DB, I create a user here, it goes into the DB. When I then stream events, I'm streaming via one of these ones from the same DB. So you would get all events um, as well. That's kind of how you solve that. And since the data is in the DB, uh, your high availability is, is more about is the database available or not. If the database is not available, we said that's okay. then our events will not be available, but that's okay because you can't query the user data in any case. So since it's, no, it's a notification event, I probably want to query the user so it, it doesn't help if I can get the event from something high available as Kafka, but I can't get the actual user. So, uh, so it's, it's all in the DB, and that's our source of truth. Right. Any other? Sorry. How do you convert from the uh, database, the events in the database, to the uh, event stream that gets surfaced? Do you do polling, or do you do something fancier there to get that? Yeah, so good question. So, I mean, it, we use polling. So, so V1 is polling. So let's say I am subscribing to user events. I'm the fraud service. I'm subscribing to user events. I open this WebSocket connection. Uh, and the server, the user server, has now spins a thread, and it's polling the DB for new events every, every 10 seconds. But now that might be too slow. And, uh, and so what we did is you, we have multiple user services, and they are all inserting events. So, uh, but when I'm reading, I'm reading via one of those services, and I don't know which one. So the user service one might be inserting a new user, and I'm streaming from user service three. So you can't use in-memory notification. Right? So I can't just be like, OK, uh, whoever is streaming uh, via me, I can let you know that I've inserted a new event. You can poll now. So we, we, we implemented something called Beep. It's just like an event notification type. Uh, so we, it's, it's based on etcd, and you basically just say, I inserted a new event, and that gets broadcasted to all the user services, and they notify all waiting streams. You can query the DB, um, they then do. So that's quite fast. You usually have about, well, it's sub-100 millisecond latency between insert and stream. And then we also implement caching and stuff like that, so it's actually quite efficient. Great. Cool, thank you very much.